Hello, everybody. Thank you for joining us today. As we wait for more people to join, I'll start promoting people from attendee to panelists. So if you do get an invite from me, accept my invitation so that you can turn your cameras and microphones off during the Q&A portion. If you, by some reason, don't get an invite, please raise your virtual hand and I'll go back to your name and make sure to promote you again. Thank you. Thank you. So, good morning and good afternoon, everybody. We'll just wait a couple more minutes till everybody logs in and then we'll begin. So, Just wait another moment or so. And I see more people have joined us. Once again, if you haven't gotten an invitation to join the call as a panelist, please raise your virtual hand so I can go back and promote you. Thank you. Okay, so we're going to start momentarily. Um, I'll just give a brief introduction to our esteemed guest, Professor Ahmed Shahid, is a, human, a professor of international human rights law in the School of Law and, human, and the Human Rights Center at the University of Essex in the United Kingdom. He directs the Human Rights Center's Religion and Equality Project, Freedom of Religion of Belief for All in Uzbekistan and, and for All in the Uzbekistan Project and the Essex Summer School on Human Rights Research and Practice. He serves as an advisor to the United Nations Office on Genocide Prevention and is a member of the panel of experts on freedom of religion or belief convened by the Office for Democratic Institutions and Human Rights for the Organization of Security and Cooperation in Europe. He served as the United Nations Special Rapporteur on Freedom of Religion uh, or for Belief from 2016 to 2022. And he served previously as the UN Special Rapporteur on Human Rights in Iran from 2011 to 2016. Uh, Professor Shahid is originally from the Maldives and serves as a, served as a foreign minister of Maldives between 2005 and 2010. He was a member of the Constitutional Assembly from 2004 to 2007 and led the government's um, effort to fast track human rights and governance reform from 2003 to 2007, which led to a transition to democracy in 2008. He's the founding chair of the Geneva-based think tank Universal Rights Group and is a senior research fellow at the Raoul Wallenberg Center for Human Rights based in Montreal. Um, and I think most importantly for our work here, uh, Professor Shahid really played an instrumental role in the United Nations, um, putting issues of anti-Semitism on the UN map and playing a, a really a leading international role in raising consciousness on issues of contemporary human rights and uh, really taking a lead role internationally in combating anti-Semitism internationally. So Ahmed Shahid, it's really an honor that you're here. And, and before you start, really, I think you're admired in uh, many circles for the work you've done on human rights and in our kind of smaller milieu, your leadership on fighting contemporary anti-Semitism. So really, thank you for being here and the floor is yours. Uh, thank you, Charles. Um, good morning, good afternoon. Everybody, it's a real privilege, pleasure, and honor uh, to be part of this important series organized by ISCAP and Wolf Institute, looking at uh, new conceptual ways of addressing anti Semitism. Um, I will today talk about the human rights approach to combating anti Semitism, very much a reflection, reflections on my work at the UN on this, on, on this subject. And I'm a great believer in the 
um, if you like, the interdisciplinary approach of this lecture series, um, especially for a subject like anti-Semitism, given the variety of ways in which the phenomenon is manifested around the world, uh, its continuous evolution, um, and the way, of course, for any form of hate speech uh, to be addressed from, from a variety of perspectives. In this particular case, you know, as we well know, there are historical perspectives, there are political perspectives, there are soci sociological perspectives, psychological definitely, um, possibly even theological perspectives that can be brought to bear on our understanding of anti-Semitism and of ways of addressing that. For me, the human rights approach itself is interdisciplinary, not just, uh, not just law, but law, philosophy, politics, and all come, come together. So it can be a very useful lens to look at a complex subject like um, anti-Semitism. And this is why partly, uh, one reason why I took that up in my time as UN Special Rapporteur on Freedom of Religion or Belief. I should also add that coming into that role, like I was working on Iran for six years as UN Special Rapporteur on Iran. And of course, on, on that mandate, you know, it's it's unavoidable to 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 come across Iran, Iran's anti-Semitic, if you if you like, you know, leadership uh, in the world as the leading, if you like, you know, purvey of anti-Semitism glo globally. So I came already into the mandate, well aware of the of the toxic nature of of this form of hatred. Um, by uh, taking a human rights approach, I don't simply mean the use of the human rights law or legal framework to analyze anti-Semitism. Of course, that's an important part of it. But I also mean, um, along with that, uh, using the different methodologies and mechanisms of promoting human rights as part of that. And I, I, I think that if you do use a human rights approach, then you have to look at the platforms, the mechanisms, the processes that are that, that come with it as a way of uh, you know, addressing the issue. So for me, it's not only a question of understanding the human rights impacts of anti-Semitism on those targeted Jews or people believed to be Jews, um, uh, but also looking at how we could use the apparatus of human rights, whether it is the existing current structures in the UN system or other structures at the national level, or the means of advancing human rights, different, different methods of doing human rights work. So the principles, cross-cutting norms, uh, that don't relate to a particular right as such. So I refer to the this, this entire I feel like entire range of tools, frameworks, laws, and norms as as uh, and and their use as a human rights approach uh, to addressing um, anti-Semitism. Of course, anti-Semitism isn't unique um, in this regard in terms of the need to take such an approach. Um, I did about twenty reports uh, for the UN, uh, and of course, as a UN special reporter, all the work has to be done both in terms of method, uh, substance, and output in ways that are compliant with the broad human rights framework. Uh, before I get to the work I did, I do want to preface my comments uh, uh, with a few um, few further uh, remarks about what I mean by the human rights uh, uh, approach, and also the mandate I had in terms of you know its its position in the UN system as a human rights human rights uh, actor. So broadly speaking, uh, the outputs I, I produced, I think some of you are aware of these, uh, included two, one full thematic report. Um, so as a special reporter, we get to publish two thematic reports a year, each of which can only be 10,000 words maximum. And we can choose a theme that we think is important uh, for us to appraise the, the, the UN system of its importance and make recommendations. So I had one full report uh, on anti-Semitism um, in 2019. Then I followed up with um, a rather creative tool because it wasn't a report I could do. So I did an action plan as an annex to my last report uh, to the uh, General Assembly, uh, a big part to the council in March this year, an eight point action plan, which I'll come to at the very end, which I think is important to be implemented to ensure that we keep the UN system and the human rights community engaged on combating uh, anti anti-Semitism. Um, and beyond that, of course, as special reporter, uh, we can issue communications to governments. And I think uh, uh, in, an, in a year on average, all the 50 odd reporters there together issue about, I think, uh, 600, 600, 700 communications a year. Um, and, um, 
the ones that these are essentially allegation letters to governments about rights violations that already occurred and therefore demanding remedy, uh, or uh, it could be urgent appeals to prevent uh, uh, rights violation from occurring. So I've used both these tools to, uh, to uh, intervene on behalf of Jewish communities uh, in many contexts, whether it is in the in context of impending plans to ban mere circumcision or impending plans or restrictions on availability of kosher food or failure of governments to act in case of uh, attacks on Jewish communities or forms of, 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 forms of anti-Semitic uh, hatred. So be, and beyond communications, I also use an, uh, my, my platform as special reporter for a number of other activities to, to convey, to raise alarm bells about my concerns about anti-Semitism. And these included what I call press statements or press releases. And three, I want to flag three uh, of these as, as, as I regard to be very important. One was something I issued with other special reporters, a uh, few others, five, six special other reporters, to commemorate the uh, 70th anniversary of liberation, um, 75th anniversary of liberation of, of Auschwitz. Uh, uh, and, and again, it was important to have brought in special reporters together to, to remind the world of, of the significance uh, of, of, of our, if you like, you know, uh, remembrance of the Holocaust and actions to, to ensure that there's ne never again means uh, ne never again. In other words, to really create awareness about the Holocaust and of course, looking at, look at what that means today in terms for, for Jewish communities and for other, other communities facing, if you like, mass, mass, mass atrocities. Um, the other one, perhaps the most controversial in terms of reactions I, I got it from various quarters, was the statement I issued uh, last year, January. So my last uh, Holocaust Remembrance Day statement, uh, in which I clearly addressed uh, you know, allegations of uh, a racism towards Zionism and uh, the, the, if you like, you know, the 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 the, the use uh, of uh, racist frames to, to delegitimize Israel, as well as uh, Zion, uh, those who advocate for for, for Zionism, and then in between, um, just ahead of the uh, COVID pandemic, or just as it began, I raised alarm bells, quite alarmed by by the fact that you know, um, as perhaps many could have foreseen, I suppose that the pandemic was very quickly blamed on, on Jews and of course others as it went along. So these press statements also become uh, become uh, very, uh, very, very uh, important statements. And beyond that, of course, I use my public profile in interviews, in social media posts, others to express concern about attacks on Jews, anti-Semitic incidents, hate crimes, again, to convey that engagement of the mandate on this. I might say that my very last action as special reporter, my last, if you like any, action as in well, my tenure held was on 31st of July when my mandate ended. I had just gone on holiday to the Maldives and I saw uh, the statements made by the, you know, the commissioner of the commission of inquiry about, um, you know, his allegations were, 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 were that, was that he was being attacked because Jews controlled the media. And of course, I, I had to strike back at that. I couldn't let that pass. And I just reminded everybody that the previous uh, May, uh, the Pakistani foreign minister had been caught out saying that on, I think, CNN, and I had complained about that. And then I said, I, I reminded the world that a UN commissioner shouldn't be doing this this kind of, if you like, you know, anti-Semitic uh, uh, statements. Um, so I had this had stayed with me, if you like, uh, for most of the, of the mandate. And I say it because I coming into the mandate, I saw a huge gap uh, in the way the UN system had addressed issues of anti-Semitism. Uh, when I came onto the mandate, I, I made it uh, my, if you like, priorities to look at hate speech, among other things. And then I, I quickly looked at the data available to me. And I found that while, well, of course, every community, every minority, uh, every community in a minority setting faced attacks, harassments, and, 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 hate, and hate speech online and offline, uh, the, not just the number of attacks on Jews were high, but the the violence that accompanied that those attacks were horrifying. Um, was horrifying. Um, so this stayed with me. The fact that when we talk about possibly 15 million, if you like, population globally, um, and the number of attacks, I forget the exact number now. It was several hundred in 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 one, uh, in, in one, in one year. Of course, going up over the previous previous year. But the sheer violence that accompanied these attacks was absolutely shocking. And so I had to look into this further. And then looking at this, I discovered that 
you know, online database at the UN system, which maintains online all communications sent by the entire UN Special Rapporteur system since 1994. Uh, look at this database. Um, I, uh, uh, you know, revealed that apart from one or two communications, there were there were none. There was none in that entire database in which a Jewish person was a beneficiary of an allegation letter sent by the special reporters to a country. Like I said, these letters are sent when there's been a, when there's been a violation. And we ask the government, you know, we tell the government, here are the facts we have received. These facts speak to really serious rights violations. And if true, we don't judge you, but if, if true, you have to do X, Y, and Z. So that's the, the format of a communication. And uh, like I said, I found one or two in which a Jewish person was a beneficiary. So I found this to be very jarring that that given the scale of if you like incidents I had documented or had come 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 to find out the the communications gap was quite uh, quite worrying. Then I did more, more detailed search into the if you like the all available human rights um, documentation, not just not just the allegation letters. And if you looked at ten thousand pages, you're looking at maybe five five pages in which there is some reference to if you like Jewish concerns. And these were also a very very of a very, uh, shall I say, um, ordinary type, meaning it would involve a visit of a special reporter to a country to examine the country's situation. And there'll be a paragraph saying, oh, by the way, the Jewish community met me and they said X, Y, and Z. Uh, and you know, if you add all these, all these paragraphs, it came to about five pages over, over, over time. So this had to be, this had to be, of course, you know, uh, addressed. Uh, this gap is, 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 is quite serious and serious for two reasons. One is, you know, every time I keep saying this, you know, uh, anti-Semitism is rising. It is, it is, it is rising, it's rising by, by the day. And the period when I came on, on uh, 2016, we'd seen a global surge in all forms of hatred, and therefore that was even more, more, more visible. So this had to be addressed uh, head on. And, you know, it's, it's, it's one of the oldest forms of hatred. It's, it's so toxic, it had to be addressed. There was one. The other was the very fact that the mandate I held uh, at the time, special report on religious freedom, was created um, to monitor government uh, adherence to, government compliance with the 1981 UN Declaration on the Elimination of All Forms of Intolerance and of Discrimination Based on Religion or Belief. Now, this document uh, was, was, the was the result of an attempt beginning in 1959 uh, to um, develop a framework to combat racism and uh, religious in, in, intolerance. And of course, for racism, there was a convention very quickly in 1965, but uh, for the treaty on the, the convention on just freedom uh, got shelved following the June 67 war, and there was no longer agreement to go, go ahead with that. But to me, most striking was that the UN began to look at religious intolerance because of concern, largely because of concern of what was called the Swastika epidemic, 1959-60. That was when UN began to look at issues of religious intolerance in a significant manner. And then it, it, then it struck me that having completed that, pro, uh, that process, in other words, the UN took up an issue that was victimized in Jews, um, was alarmed with it appropriately, and developed a universal framework that will support everybody in that, and then dropped Jews from its con consideration of, if you like, you know, uh, protections within. I, I'm not saying they did it deliberately, but the evidence shows that that you know there has been a disconnect between concerns raised by Jew, uh, raised by Jews, or uh, faced by Jews, and the way this framework was being applied. And of course, there must be many reasons for this, but the fact that this this gap existed was a matter of serious uh, concern to me. So I felt that this had to be addressed. And of course, the 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 other the other important fact, and this is again the reason why I think a human rights approach to combating anti-Semitism is, is very, very important, is what Charles, Charles Charles Bates notes that human rights have become the moral touchstone of global of the global of global political life. Of course, we have today populists pushing back against human rights, but by and large, still we regard human rights to be a, an ethical framework by which it is it is good to judge government actions. Um, to, to and determine legitimacy of the actions, not just governments, but also international bodies and other organizations. So human rights still remains the, the, the moral touchstone. And, and be that as it may, we are finding, uh, or the, uh, one could say from the Durban Conference of 19, uh, 19, 2001, that 
that uh, human rights framework is being is being used to delegitimize, you know, Jewish concerns, Israel itself, and any advocacy of Zionism, as if, as if the 1975 resolution on uh, the, the the UN General Assembly, which equated Zionism with racism, has been rebirthed as reborn a, a, as it were. So it was important for me that concerns about anti-Semitism are also aired within human rights framework that is either equal, as well, certainly be equal, but certainly to, to push back against the frame, that, that one cannot use a human rights framework to undermine rights of the people. Of course, this happens in other contexts as well. Uh, if, if you look at the use of human rights arguments to deny women their sexual health and reproductive rights, one see how this can be done as well. But, but in the case of anti-Semitism, in the case of Israel, we were seeing how a human rights argument was being used in ways that were counter to human rights principles. In other words, to deny someone else's equal dignity, to deny someone equal someone else's, someone else's equal rights. And therefore, another reason why the Human Rights Council had to hear from the special reporters, in this case, from me, uh, that the, the concerns were there. But of course, this wasn't an easy, if you like, um, uh, if you like, journey to make. Uh, one, of course, is, is, the, is, the, is the fact that my mandate is not so directly understood to be linked to anti-Semitism. Um, there's a mandate on, on racism, uh, and that mandate has uh, has been looking at what, what is called neo-Nazism and forms of contemporary racism in Europe, which includes reports on, if you like, you know, fascism uh, and, and neo-Nazi episodes that target, you know, uh, that is anti-Semitic in European contexts. But my concern was, as a human rights, it has to be global. And of course, in a day of online activity, which of course, you know, perhaps dwarfs offline uh, communications in many ways, it has to be universal. Uh, it had to be universal. And in my own travels at that point, I'd been to Tunisia, I'd been to Uzbekistan, I'd been to other places as a mandate holder. Uh, it was obvious that, you know, this phenomenon had to go beyond uh, uh, Europe. And of course, my experience with Iran tells me it can't simply be focused on Europe. So this had to be done. But there was one, one issue was making sure my mandate had, had a link to it. The other was, in my initial conversations with many Jewish communities, uh, quite rightly so, there was huge skepticism that anything I do might come out right. Uh, in other words, it, it was fair to, I think, be suspicious of the UN's intentions, or at least what might come out of it, even if I was well-intentioned. Um, so that reluctance had to really, had to, really uh, to be surmounted. So I argue that I'm applying the human rights approach here, and that involves the old, if you like, it involves participation. It involves participation of the relevant stakeholders. So it will not be a report I write on my own in some ivory tower. It will be a report that I, you know, uh, develop particip particip in a participatory manner with the relevant stakeholders. In other words, allowing their inputs, enabling them to see how my work is progressing so with transparency, accountability, and so on and so forth. And to, uh, and to of, of course, to get this rolling on, I was very fortunate to have support of some Jewish communities uh, who had seen my work uh, some time and, and had, I suppose, faith in, 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 my, in my work. So these communities uh, convened for me a meeting in Geneva in 2018, uh, a summer, uh, to have a first cut, as it were, of you know where we, where we can go uh, with this. And again, like I said, there was a lot of lot of skepticism, doubt, concern, genuine concern that that something could go wrong with the, with, with this output. But then also a willingness to really contribute and and, co and cooperate. Uh, following which I issued a call for sub submissions, open to everybody, and I got some very interesting ones, some very useful ones, de de definitely. But I also convened uh, a number of consultations. Um, one uh, in New York to begin with, uh, with with a range of um, most active uh, Jewish human rights defenders and uh, uh, monitors of anti of anti-Semitism. Um, in a full day conference uh, uh, at the Jacob Lustre Institute in 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 New York, and then followed by a number of uh, customized workshops or consultation meetings in many 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 countries of the world. So I went to. I went to Montreal and Ottawa for similar meetings with Jewish communities uh, um, uh, in these cities, visiting Jewish Jewish centers, sites, schools, meeting uh, community uh, members, uh, Ottawa and Montreal, and similarly uh, in Paris, Vienna, uh, Budapest, um, Geneva, uh, London as well, and then of course uh, one final meeting in Washington uh, 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 towards the end. And of course, once my report was drafted, also. I ensured that it was peer reviewed 
by a whole wide, wide range of, if you like, actors, not just, of course, Jewish community interlocutors, them as well, but also human rights experts, so that, so, so that I was sure that what I was saying actually made sense to a wide range of actors committed to upholding human rights standards. All my reports do that. All my reports are peer reviewed by relevant human rights experts. So having done all of that, um, again, I was very careful that uh, that I sort of, you know, I have a good strategy for rolling this out. So I chose to do this uh, report in, Gen in New York rather than Geneva because Geneva is a much smaller space, 47 member states. It also has the, the Delburn Action Program. It, it, if you like, it's core. Um, and then, you know, um, We've seen over time how how toxic Geneva gets uh, on on issues of Israel, uh, and of course, and through that, uh, uh, modern forms of anti-Semitism in some in some areas. But Geneva, New York was a bigger bigger environment, full UN membership, and therefore I presumed, uh, I think quite correctly, that this would be a far more uh, open space for healthy discussion. And I was quite um, surprised, uh, you know, pleasantly, uh, with the welcome that I received. But along the way, there were some complaints I received from, from many from some stakeholders. One of course was that I was breaking up a tradition in the UN system that if a special rapporteur on religious freedom takes up a issue that concerns one religious community, it is done with all communities together. So the, the, the argument was that all Abrahamic faiths have been dealt together in the past. So why, why was I breaking that tradition and picking up, picking on choosing one community for special focus? And my, my argument was the approach of you know, I haven't changed my, my approach of regarding all faiths to be of equal, or people of all faiths to have equal human dignity. It's just that you have to understand a problem in detail, its nuance, for you to really appreciate its specificity and be able to really fashion some responses to deal with this. Um, and so doing a report in all religions all the time meant that I only get one paragraph, maybe 50 words, maybe 100 words, on say anti-Semitism, 100 words on anti-Muslim hatred and so on. So far, it doesn't get me anywhere with any of these, if you like, forms of uh, hatred uh, and concern. So that that was, that, if you like, you know, uh, the first difficulty I, I had to uh, get through. But once this was this was done, um, you know, um, I was happy with the uh, uh, engagement I had, and I was quite happy with some of the immediate responses I received. Now, I, I made recommendations also based on consultations. Um, and one, con one recommendation that came to me consistently from Jewish communities was uh, the need to have a, a senior focal point in the office of the Secretary General reporting to him directly that would monitor anti-Semitic you know, incidents and, and will coordinate efforts to combat anti-Semitism. And I made this recommendation in one of my in the report, and I was very happy that Secretary General picked this up. And in a few months' time, had appointed a, a, a special representative for this task. In fact, assigned a current uh, Deputy Secretary, Under Secretary General to that role, Mr. Um, uh, Moratinos, to be that that individual. And beyond that, also I was happy to see uh, a number of other changes in the UN system, whereby even Geneva began to pay more attention to issues of of uh, combating anti-Semitism. I also believe that the focus that this uh, this enabled other states, uh, you know, to, to give to anti-Semitism also helped. This included, I think, uh, in the rise. I'm not saying the report caused it, but the report was coeval with many developments. Uh, I did focus uh, quite a bit on the IHRA working definition, analyzing it, recommending its adoption, and and suggesting the ways it can be used and should, shouldn't be used. And I think this enabled many governments, which had at that point been uncertain what to do with it, to adopt the working definition along with its eleven with its examples, let's um, say examples of what could be considered anti-Semitic. And I think that was a very positive move. And of course, beyond that, because I was using my my role, its convening power to hold meetings, address conferences, and so on and so forth, I managed to give more visibility. And I found that a number of countries had increased the number of envoys that are in this, in this field. Again, I could work with them, again, to give more visibility in, in this area. But crucial to this wasn't so much as my report as support of the Jewish community for this engagement. Without Jewish community's engagement with all these different envoys, none of us would have been able to work at all. But that engagement was what really, really drove it. Along with, of course, the fact that, you know, every year we document, every year we document increasing, uh, with increasing horror, uh, if, if you like, you know, rising uh, uh, anti anti-Semitic hatred. So at the at the end of uh, my work, um, well, uh, my my tenure as a reporter, I issued the 
eight point action plan. And again, uh, like I said, it was based on a lot of consultations. Key elements in this include governments communicating zero tolerance of anti Semitic speech. In other words, they should communicate that you know, such actions would be tolerated. Of course, it doesn't mean criminalize them, but it means that they will act, react to these statements in an appropriate manner according to the human rights framework. Other things included making sure that countries had national coordinators well resourced, uh, well equipped to monitor and coordinate national efforts to combat anti Semitism, drawing on good practice in some countries, including, of course, developing national action plans uh, to do that. The other was, of course, adopting the IHRA working definition, and not just adopting it, but making sure that people were trained in its use, in its proper use, so that the, so the concern about say, abuse uh, would, be, would be lessened. Of course, all hate speech is contextual, and therefore all hate speech requires judgments we made, and therefore all hate speech would necessarily have some, some controversy. But the state obligation to make sure that they respond to hate speech, which also means that they must also have a responsibility to train, build capacity of its users to use the, the tool appropriately. And uh, others, of course, in included protecting Jewish communities and Jewish practice. Uh, in many, in many, many, uh, in too many states, uh, Jewish centers and uh, place of uh, Jewish life, as it were, comes under violent attack or, or, or other forms of vandalism. And that has, that has to be stopped and reacted to. Uh, likewise, again, concern about perhaps from secular, secular arguments or from other reasons, not necessarily anti-Semitic, but the impact is quite significant of measures to curtail access to kosher food or to impose bans on male circumcision. Again, to protect Jewish life, uh, these things had to be addressed by, this, by these countries. Another, another element was a concerted effort to address online um, expressions of anti-Semitism. Again, working with tech companies, uh, making sure the, the, the measures are consistent with international human rights law, but certainly also responding to concerns by Jewish communities about anti-Semitic uh, content on, uh, online. And also, I also added a call to the UN to take soccer of itself to be self-reflective and to ensure that its staff were trained uh, in, in detecting anti-Semitic anti uh, content and was able to respond uh, to anti-Semitism as they would train uh, staff in other forms of uh, racist uh, bias and, 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 and actions. And uh, although this came at the end of my mandate, I'm happy with some of the responses received, received uh, 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 to it. One of which, of course, is a statement by the UN Office on Genocide Prevention, uh, whose, uh, whose chief said that she would take up the report and adopt it and make it part of her work. And I look forward to working with her to make it further operational in her office. And beyond that, of course, un unlinked to the work I was doing, I was happy to note that UNESCO and the ODEA in Warsaw working on developing educational tools, along with some universities in the UK, King's College, in developing curriculum uh, that, that would um, enable teachers to, to address and some of the classroom context and also develop curriculum that could be used by, used by students. And uh, one thing I argued here was that it was very important that, in, that we go beyond Holocaust education or that we go beyond depicting Jews as victims of the Holocaust. Uh, they have to learn about the Holocaust, of course, but they also have to learn about the entire breadth of Jewish life uh, in its all, all its richness and splendor. The contribution Jews have made to civilization, the, 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 what they make today, and of course, the important role um, in our societies. That, the, that full experience, 360 degree experience, must be known to, to students that they develop empathy and, and are able to deal with uh, stereotypes um, and other tropes when they're confronted with that. So that is something I, I am very insistent on, and uh, it's, I'm, I'm happy I'm being listened to uh, uh, on this. My final uh, recommendation to everybody was that they double their efforts in using the UN mechanisms and platforms to combat anti-Semitism. Now, this might mean this might sound counterintuitive to many because the UN remains not the UN continues to be a source of pain and heartache for Jewish communities for, for its consistent, if you like, you know, failure to uphold uh, equal rights of Jewish communities, for, for its use of uh, Palestinian concerns in ways that demonize Israel, that, that demonize Jews, and therefore become anti-Semitic uh, uh, through, through that window. Um, but I do think there is huge space to use the same, same platforms to assert equal dignity for everybody. Universality me, me, means that. An example would be what the what the World Jewish Congress is proposing to do with the what is called the UPR system. The Universal Periodic Review re, uh, requires all states to be reviewed for the human rights work 
by the council, by the UN system uh, in a cycle of about four and a half years. We've had three cycles, and the research done by WJC showed that a total of over 90,000 recommendations made to state on do this, don't do that, et cetera, et cetera. Only 70 were involved issues of concern to Jews. In other words, 70 about anti-Semitic or Holocaust denial con content. And again, of the 70, uh, most were directed at a few states. And um, of the 70, 10 were rejected. So only 60 recommendations were accepted by states as something they were willing to uh, act on. I think there's more space to be filled there, more space to be used, and therefore uh, important to do that. I also noticed that often various platforms used by the UN to combat hate speech often uh, do not bring in Jewish voices. So uh, something called the Istanbul process, uh, it's, a, it's something coming out of the UN resolution to combat hate speech from 2011. Again, um, you know, I think there have been about nine, eight or nine meetings so far, and only on a very few occasions is a Jewish voice heard in this. In other words, Jewish community, um, you know, uh, monitors and rights activists aren't really invited to this. They should be invited more frequently and be made a central part of this framework as well. And other, th other things would be the use in the UN's SDG framework, Sustainable Development Goal framework, to ensure that this also includes um, a training about hate speech and therefore through that concerns of Jewish communities. Um, and therefore using that framework as well. So my 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 conception is that the entire UN framework uh, should be used to advance uh, to advance the fight against uh, anti-Semitism. Human rights have the distinct advantage of of demanding that states have an obligation to respect, protect, and fulfill the rights of Jews. Um, in some contexts, I came across in my travels, um, Jewish communities, and happens to many minority communities. Um, Rather than assert a legal rights entitlement uh, for, the, uh, for them, um, what history has shown perhaps to them is that what might work better in that context is a political solution to a problem. That rather than demand that you know, X and Y should be available to Jewish communities by their right, it is negotiated by the government of the day in ways that make compromises, but might appease the government of the day. For me, this is, not acceptable, at least from my standpoint. Of course, I can't say no to this, but my idea is that that's not how it's not appropriate. There should be equal entitlement, and this should be demanded by by right, not because of a concession made by by states. Same with, for example, concession. Example: the issue, uh, issue of, say, kosher food in Europe. There's a legal right uh, for uh, faith-based communities to have access to the, to the practice of their faith uh, that doesn't harm other people, and therefore it's not a concession made by governments that they give exemption. Um, uh, that they give ex exception to Jews uh, for, 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 for kosher food or for Muslims for halal food. They should be exempted because it's their birth, it's their entitlement as a human right uh, to have access to that, that food. So this, this legal demand is important to me. So what I try to argue with the UN is that the UN has, and states up, uh, in the UN system have legal obligations to respect, protect, and uh, um, uh, respect, protect, uh, and promote uh, the concerns of Jews, human rights of Jews, including an ob a legal obligation to combat anti-Semitism along with all forms of hate speech. And, I, and I, my, my, my ask is that um, in, the, in the time to come as well, this uh, approach is taken forward, that we ask that like everybody else, universal rights apply to everybody. We begin with article one, right to self-determination. We go to end article 27, State, uh, states should not deny uh, minorities in, the, in, in, in their uh, states to enjoy um, their you know, religious, uh, uh, cultural, and linguistic and other rights that belong to, to the minorities. So the legal entitlements are important. And by taking the human rights approach, we make sure that uh, states are obligated to do so. And finally, the, the human rights approach also means that states are required to demonstrate by engaging with the rights, with the rights holders by their participation to assess how well they're actually performing in fulfilling their obligations. So it's no good saying we adopted IRA working definition, fine, do that as well. But there should also be a, a, a method by which they, they assess to, what, to how far they have actually embedded IRA working definition as an operational tool, how far they have trained people in its use, how far they invested resources in, in uh, responding and monitoring this, and also importantly, how far they are able to solicit the views of the concerned communities in terms of whether or not they feel protected. And, and that 
that uh, operational method known as the uh, structure process outcome framework has to be used to ensure that states are fulfilling the obligations uh, towards Jews and everybody else in regard to, to human rights. So with these advantages of human rights framework is, is why I thought that I should take up the issue of anti-Semitism in, in the UN framework and uh, uh, argue for everybody to take up this case as a human rights concern for everybody. I shall end there and, and, and look forward to any comments and feedback you may have. Thank you. You're muted, Charles. Sorry about that. I gave a whole speech. <laughs> um, sorry. So, Ahmed, thank you very much for your important research, uh, as important presentation and all the work you've been doing on the issues of human rights, religious freedom, and, and certainly anti-Semitism. I'm going to ask a very uh, brief question, and then I would like to call on Professor Owen Kotler, who's here, who's the head of the Raoul Wallenberg uh, Foundation. So my quick question to you is, so you've outlined um, all the work that you've done in terms of combating anti-Semitism and trying to bring the Jewish community and issues of anti-Semitism into the human rights framework and, and in the United Nations and in, in, into international bodies, um, which is vital. I, I'm seeing these issues from another perspective. I'm involved in, I guess, scholarly discourse when it comes to to Israel, Zionism, and the Jewish community, the, the Jews, and how the, the discourse in academia has shifted over the decades from Jews being, you know, victims of racism, victims of uh, European anti-Semitism, to not being white and exterminated because of it, to now, in a very short period of time, being labeled as not only white, but sort of the quintessential white supremacist, racist, apartheid supporters. So the discourse is becoming uglier and I believe that this discourse is gaining traction in society because the, the graduates of our finest universities go on to take leadership roles with these you know ideas that they've learned through their education. So how do you from a legal perspective deal with the shifting discourse and perception of the Jew and how it feeds into contemporary anti-Semitism? How can a human rights framework and international organizations address this, sort of, I think, very pressing challenge. Um, thank you, Charles. It's a very, very important question. I think that shift of perception, as it were, or discourse uh, or narrative is precisely why the human rights framework is so valuable. If you look at the Durban platform, Durban conference platform, if you look at what happened there, and if you look at what was agreed and what came out and what's been done with it, it's very clear that you cannot uh, you know, use a human rights framework to demonize another, if you like, a community of human beings. You know that's why the universality of rights uh, is is important here. Uh, Article five of the ICCPR says very clearly that no right in that covenant, as a civil rights covenant, can be used to destroy any other right. So one can never assert a right that they uh, are entitled to um, in a way that undermines rights of others. Um, but that that discourse about, you know, um, I mean, the discourse relies on traditional tropes that are anti-Semitic. Jews being very powerful, too powerful, all powerful, controlling and, and all of that. Ultimately, it does fall back, uh, fall back um, on, on, on those stereotypes. It's just that um, I think um, the, the, the left, as it were, you know, has become very fragmented in, in many ways. Um, uh, and we see today, I think, uh, Charles, you make this point somewhere else, I think, how fragmented we've become uh, uh, as a movement, uh, the human rights movement, and how selective we are in choosing causes. And, and you know, very often we have even right-wing uh, groups taking up causes and then, you know, picking up others. So that, that fragmentation of the, if you like, the rights movement is all the more reason why we should uphold the universality of, of human rights and everyone's entitlement to that. And given that this narrative has come to the UN framework, it's doubly important that the UN system itself takes this up very, very, very seriously. And that's why I think we should hold to task uh, various UN uh, functionaries in uh, the way they discharge their, their, their mandates. Uh, I mentioned the Commission of Inquiry. For me, it's 
unimaginable to have a commissioner uh, speak that and say he didn't know that. I don't think he said that, but if he didn't know that, then obviously he shouldn't be a commissioner. If he did know that, he still shouldn't be a commissioner. Um, so the, the point is you can't have, uh, and of course the, the idea the idea for me would be, and you now I would have, I would suggest to you, Ren, that, that, like I said earlier, they should require that all key personnel undergo non-discrimination training. They already do that. But add to this, add to this training on detecting anti-Semitism. So um, I think we need to more work. Um, and a, a comparable area would be, like I said, the anti-women's uh, rights movement. They also very much often frame rights that undermine women's right to bodily autonomy uh, um, uh, in ways that are framed as human rights. So the, the, the human rights abuse is also uh, not uncommon. Again, in the, in the mandate I held, religious freedom mandate, it's very, very frequent that you know the blasphemy laws in many countries are often raised as in defense of religious freedom. It's not. It's actually a way of abusing, undermining someone else's rights. So the, the rights, the clash amongst rights can only be resolved by, uh, by taking human rights more seriously, engaging with it more thoroughly, and be mindful of the fact that no human rights, no human right can be sacrificed for another human right. No human being can be sacrificed for it for another person. So these are, I think, basic lessons we can draw from the rights framework. Okay, thank, thank you, you very much, thank you. So Professor Erwin Kotler, formerly a human rights professor at McGill University, Minister of Justice in the Canadian government and the founder of the Raoul Wallenberg Center. Erwin, the floor is yours for a comment or question. Well, first I want to, you know, commend Dr. Shahid for his landmark, uh, not only report on anti-Semitism, but his landmark work with respect uh, to anti-Semitism. I, I think we have all been uh, his beneficiaries and he has been a transformative voice uh, with regard to <clears throat> universalizing the approach to combating anti-Semitism through the uh, lens of human rights, which brings me to the uh, particular a concern that I, I've noticed in my last uh, two years as, as special envoy for combating anti-Semitism. And that is that the traditional paradigm for combating anti-Semitism, combating anti-Semitism from the far right, the far left, radical uh, Islam is no longer even, while still true, sufficient. That what I've witnessed has been the increasing mainstreaming, right. <clears throat> normalizing, uh, legitimation, of anti-Semitism in the political culture, the popular culture, entertainment culture, sports culture, and particularly uh, in the uh, campus uh, culture. And my question is how one can combat it when it is the human rights lens that is through which this mainstreaming has taken place. Uh, I noted uh, recently a statement by uh, Ken Roth who said that there is not a human rights organization in the world that doesn't believe that Israel is not an apartheid state. Now, apartheid is defined in international law as a crime against humanity. If you say that Israel is an apartheid state, a dynamic that began at, at, at Durban in 2001, and I was present at the time, but if you say that Israel is an apartheid state, you're saying in effect that it's a crime against humanity. If it is a crime against humanity, it has no right to be. And once you add all the other adjectival uh, <coughs> characteristics, namely that Israel is a racist, imperialist, colonialist, child murdering, ethnic uh, cleansing, uh, apartheid uh, state, then you get to the point that people feel, well, not only does it have no right to be, but we have an obligation to see that it is no right to be. So how does one combat that particular use of, let's say, an epithet such as anti-apartheid, which is becoming increasingly mainstreamed and then underpins what we see as the mainstreaming increasingly of anti-Semitism. Um, if I may respond, Charles? Yes, please. Uh, thank you. Um, Professor Kotler, always good to see you. And thank you for a very, very important question. Um, this is, I think, the question of the day. You know, How do we actually ensure that uh, this demonizing, the, an escalation of demonizing of Israel can be responded. I think we are in for a very bumpy ride here in the next few years as well. But we have to be very clear in our vision of what we're doing, what we're doing here. Um, two things about about this. First of all, you know, on my in my time as special reporter, I always objected to the use of the term apartheid state. 
And, and this obstructed me in many ways, expressing concern um, about actions of the government of Israel, which deserved uh, uh, my expression of concern. Uh, with all governments at the end of the day, you know, at some point or the other, uh, take actions that that deserve to be called out. But I refuse, but I couldn't call them out in uh, statements that had attached to it apartheid state, or in other ways were unbalanced uh, in the way it, it uh, uh, so, so an issue. So first is to rec to to argue that this actually hurts the campaign that singling out Israel in that manner and trying to delegitimize it. And as you said, the, with the goal of of if you like, you know, supporting moves to eradicate it, ha you know, have to be called out. And, and I think we need to build that moral framework against the, this metaphor used not for a legal uh, a reason, but, but a fair, by and large clearly for a propaganda purpose to, to, to demonize and delegitimize uh, 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 that state. If uh, can people prepare to apply legal constructs to states, they should do it to, I think, all states. Uh, if if there isn't, if there are of course concerns about Israel, and many concerns, is, and I think Israelis themselves, are, I think, are forefront of of air in them. But but if uh, you know one wants wants to apply a diff different convention to different states, do it to all states. Uh, and and there are many candidates out, out there who can who will fall fall off many of the treaties and and and, and uh, conventions that they have signed. But I think uh, the use of the apartheid and analogy is not for legal purpose. The legal arguments were added later on, I think, but it became very much a propaganda tool to, de to delegitimize um, and to maximize the demands of those who wish to actually erase Israel uh, from the map. And that is a concern, concern here. Um, I'm not saying uh, that Palestinians don't have a right of determination. They do. All I'm saying is that in this case, you know, uh, no party here has a right to eliminate the other. That's where the human rights framework will say no to each each of the parties. So 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 they so determined to do that, and we and and there's been um, significant work done how to resolve this issue. It's just, it's just that rather than resolve the issue, we hear constantly. I, I refer recently to 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 a to a, to a incident I think in Oxford or Cambridge in the UK uh, when uh, when some part uh, students protested to uh, what I thought was a statement that I should also object to uh, by by a speaker. Uh, but the response was one again. I would discuss as, as, as a bit. The response was again. I think it was from the uh, river to the sea or whatever, right? This coded, coded uh, a word for saying eliminate Israel. So I think we have to educate people, raise awareness as to what these terms mean. That even if there could be a purely technical argument being made here, that cannot be made in the you know blind to the context in which it is made if one reads the ecri's two docu documents on the subject the ecri uh, opinion on the ihra working definition of july 2020 and perhaps better the ecri's revised policy guidance on on number 9 on antisemitism of of july 2021 i think these arguments become very clear that you can have if you like real concerns raised but the underlying intents are to be understood the, 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 I, I refer to the Rabat plan of action uh, in my uh, report, and we all do that. And it says the context matters, the intent matters, the extent matter. And so if you apply these the, the six tests, these six tests, any action that can that has its at its motivation uh, in at its intent to legitimize the standing of another with legitimate rights, Article one of the of the ICPR gives us a determination. If that is then denied, then I think we have problems. I think we need more on education, more on education, more capacity building, and more engagement with uh, policymakers uh, who seem to see who are myopic in not seeing the full picture of, of, of what we're talking about. I think uh, Professor Kotler, you've done excellent work in, in this area, um, um, as both as the special envoy uh, of the Canadian government, but also in your own capacity for a long time. I think more of us need to be doing that. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you, Erwin. So does anybody, I think Ariel, you had your hand up, but I think it's down. Do you still want to ask your question? And then everybody, if you have a comment or question, please raise your electronic hand. I see Carrie. Yes. yes. Um, can I go ahead? Okay. Yes, please go ahead, Ariel. Thank you so much. Uh, and thank you, Professor Shahid. Uh, we overlap uh, in part uh, during your mandate. I was a member of the UN Working Group on Enforced Disappearances. And I, I know how difficult it is to raise the issue of anti-Semitism within the, the UN uh, 
uh, space. Um, my, my question or my comment is more about, and connected with the previous one, is more about the mainstream human rights organizations. And um, my sense is that it's becoming more and more difficult to talk with them about anti-Semitism, not so much about anti-Zionism, but anti-Semitism in general, and they tend either to ignore the issue or to downplay the, the gravity. Um, so I, I, I would like to, to hear more about how your reports and your work was received by the mainstream human rights movement uh, and the uh, traditional human rights organizations such as Human Rights Watch, Amnesty International, the International Commission of Tourists or, or, or other similar organizations. Thank you. Um, thank you very much. I think my report of 2019 was by and large well received across the board. Um, um, I did receive, if you like, criticism from both sides of the I if I could say that, and I can just tell you what the points of, of concern were. Uh, some were unhappy that I didn't condemn BDS outright. Uh, by contrast, others were happy that I implied BDS could be anti-Semitic. So I got both criticisms from both sides. And I think I went down the middle, uh, in, a, in my view of quite a human rights, uh, uh, as an, I think, uh, uh, appropriate fashion. The other was um, on anti-Zionism. Again, I didn't say anti-Zionism is inherently um, uh, anti-Semitic. Uh, neither would I say that Zionism is also uh, you know, inherently uh, racist. So again, again, you have to look at what is not the label, but precisely what is one advocating here and what impact this has on other people's rights. So it's not so much a label as what it is trying to do that, that mattered um, uh, to me. Um, so uh, um, the, 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 the groups you mentioned, uh, some of them explicitly endorsed it. Uh, you said UN Watch. Uh, I was very happy to see UN Watch actually um, saying they were happy with, with, the, with the report. I didn't receive any criticism from any, uh, any uh, um, you know, part of the human rights movement for that report. But I should say there were other aspects of my work that did receive criticism. Uh, one was the July, tw uh, January 2022 20 statement on Holocaust Remembrance Day, in which I condemned um, those who equated um, Zionists as inherently racist, ra racist, and arguing that this is, you know, an uh, 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 incorrect position. And I cited, of course, uh, uh, in support my view, Ecri's own position on this. And of course, it's it's it's, in, it's it, quite clear even by itself. And I had some special reporters join me in that. Um, so it was I wasn't alone in arguing that position, but it was a minority view. Uh, and um, more than more, more than that, beyond the UN system, it came under a lot, lot of fire. But I stand by my my argument. My I, I think I, even for that, I had a very very uh, feel like you know nuanced position, clear line. I'm not alone in that line. So I cite Ecri again uh, in my defense here, yeah, as well as other uh, you know human rights uh, well known experts. Um, um, and then my action plan uh, came uh, some, under some questioning from some mainstream human rights organizations, but not really uh, criticism, but asking me how I explained my defense of the IHRA working definition in view of the Jerusalem Declaration. And my response is that uh, many, many fold. I think uh, Professor Kotler has the best defense of this, but my argument essentially is that you know, um, human rights law is based on state practice, and in particular of those countries which have a standing in the in terms of the need to respond to this. So, in those countries where there are Jewish communities, in those countries where there are efforts to monitor anti-Semitic hate crimes, in those countries where there is ways to do so, these countries almost unanimously, uh, there could be a few holdouts, but almost unanimously have adopted the IHRA working definition, and even beyond the adoption. Even the framing of the definition was done through uh, what, what can be called uh, deliberative means by discussion amongst the relevant stakeholders, by uh, open discussion, uh, debate, negotiation, and something was done. That that second uh, second point, and third point is that it's a non-legal, non-binding, non-legal tool for educational purposes, drawing already from existing practice of monitors. So it therefore it it has standardized the practice for for purpose of comparison. That's again you, you, uh, useful. And then uh, finally, I do say in my uh, report that as with any hate speech definition, apply Rabat action plan uh, test and use the general comment 34 of the Committee on uh, Human Rights and 35 of the third uh, committee. All of which says 
context is so important. It's contextual and not content uh, as such. And if you look at the Jerusalem closely, they say if and if if uh, it says it's contextual, and also again it says um, not inherently so. So I think it also has many riders to it. It comes from the same from the other side. It comes from the perspective of trying to eliminate, tell us what is not anti-Semitic rather than telling us what is anti-Semitic. For monitoring purposes, it's important to know what is anti-Semitic without actually uh, extending that to what is not anti-Semitic. So I think on its own, um, IRA still remains the best tool that people have to monitor anti-Semitism. That's why I, I, I defend it. I didn't face much, much pushback on this, but I do realize uh, that there is a concerted effort to delegitimize the IRA working, uh, working definition. And what I would really find sad, shocking, and distressing would be if the UN decided to define anti-Semitism, um, again, without having defined racism, without having defined any other hate speech, but why even set to define anti-Semitism? They haven't done so, but let's talk of doing that. So I would be very shocked and surprised and distressed if you UN decided that, that the UN member states of 193 states gets to decide when a Jewish person should feel hurt, when a Jewish person should take offense, and when the, someone could act on this. Of course, offense, uh, feeling hurt doesn't re require a legal response, but feeling hurt has to be understood, has to be documented, and has to be, that's where we start with, to see whether the threshold has reached a point where state action is required. But it must always begin with the person who is the affected person. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ahmed. Uh, Kari, please, you're next. Uh, thank you for this really quite wonderful presentation and for your incredibly important work um, at the UN. I mean, I think when your report came out in 2019, it was almost a sense of shock <laughs> that something so um, liberating would come out of the UN process. I mean, in a way, I'm still astonished <laughs> that uh, you were able to do it. I have a conceptual question and a practical one. The conceptual question is, you've identified at least one major way in which uh, the principle of human rights has been distorted in some anti-Zionist work, that, it, that, it's, that human rights principles are being used to attack the human rights of a given specific population. So that's a really, I think that's a, just a fundamental principle that's worth thinking about. And so I'm curious whether there are whether there are others, other ways in which some of that work has uh, uh, been a distortion of the human rights principle. And then I hope this isn't too invasive, but I just can't avoid asking a personal question, which is, what has it been like to sort of swim against the tide in an organization? Um, I mean, you do so with such equanimity, equanimity to today, but it can't have been easy along the way. I'm just curious what you would say on that count. Thank you. I beg your pardon. On the first question, well, thank you so much for your very kind words about, about the report. Um, you know, it's very much the fruit of contributions made by uh, all the contributed, uh, many of whom were Jewish community uh, members. I might have added that I also call for submissions and I receive a lot of submissions uh, from them. And just to dig digress a little bit, uh, one submission said that, you know, anti-Semitism has two words, anti and Semitism. Uh, Semites aren't just Jews. Semites, Semitic language is spoken by X, Y, and Z, and therefore it's about everybody. And then uh, it said, no, we had dropped the, you know, I don't use a hyphen here because it's not anti-Semites as, as opposed as saying, I'm opposing Semites. It's one word, anti-Semitism, a word that has been used by Jews uh, for over, over a century, maybe more, uh, to to identify their understanding of being demonized on account of on of account of their you know uh, of race as as it was a form of racism. And then I had to have a big fight with the UN system uh, to have the, the UN still uses anti-hyphen Semitic in that. So the editors were adamant that you know I, I maintain, maintain that. Said okay, if you I mean, of course, editors got a veto on us because you know they are the language gatekeepers. So sure, of course, but please add a footnote which says that um, this government and I won't name the government because I didn't do it. This government made a submission uh, to the uh, to me saying that um, 
anti-Semitism is from, from of two words, anti and Semite, and we are Semites, and that, therefore this is also about blah, blah, blah. I said, okay, and then, and that this, and therefore the presence of the hyphen in this report in no way endorses the claim by the government because it's not about Semite. So at that point, the, the if you like, the, the hyphen got dropped. So, you can, so I said this because sense of the extent we have to negotiate even small things to make sure that you get your message right. Um, but yes, um, it. Um, I think I was warned sufficiently by 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 um, uh, Jewish community interlocutors of the tough path I was getting into because I was working with some who have very long experience in the UN system. Uh, but but of course, you know, um, nothing in the job I've done in on any subject has been easy. I've done very difficult subjects. Um, I think uh, the report on gender equality was also a very difficult one uh, because the, the path I chose was not to look for the law in court rulings and documents and what judges and courts say is, is important, but also to hear what people on the ground say, people who can't come to Geneva, who can't come to New York, what they say about their experience of what we regard to be rights entitlement. So I traveled across the globe listen to people and bring in their perspective. So what had what had going was the knowledge that these actually spoke to what people said to me. So when I am saying this in, in the report, I am saying it because this community said, said this to me. You have to visit a school of Jewish children. You know, I'm sure you do it, of course. But for me, it was striking to have visited several schools uh, in, in Western democracies. And it's like me going to a prison uh, you know, um, it's not how you go to school. I have small children. I wouldn't want my children to be sort of feel that, feel like sheet mentality, that iron, you know, uh, um, iron sheet doors, barbed wires, police cars. It's as if you were in a prison prison yard from uh, nine nine to three or whatever time, right? That itself uh, is a problem. Then I meet a parents who tell me that what happens to them when they travel by train. Some of them do, um, and long distance as well. What happens to them if the, of course, the you know um, the dress can can be identify, identifiable uh, or the or, what, or it can be identified some other means. What happens to them if they are identified as Jewish? Even little children, what happens to them? So this kind of, if you like, you know, anti-Semitic um, expression is what gives me the if you like resistance to fight. If you like, you know, people saying I am getting it wrong and so on and so forth. And and of course, um, um, at the end of the day, like I said. The validation very much depends on my own um, belief that I am doing the right thing, and also of the uh, legitimation of the uh, rights rights holders. The the fact that I have not been, uh, I feel like, found wanting uh, in my human rights analysis or found wanting uh, in my judgment in re in regard to being independent and staying the line, has been helpful. Um, but across the across the road, I had to come. I came across quite significant, deeply held wild prejudice um, that was hurled at me. And I think to be expected uh, when, when you work uh, as a human rights monitor in, in a world that's very polarized and when you work on hate, on, on, on hate speech. Um, your, your first question is apart from, if you like, you know, the, the, uh, um, the uh, use of the racist frame uh, to undermine standing of another community. There are many examples of rights being used more than, if you like, uh, their, their entitlement uh, for, for use. Not many rights are unqualified. You know, freedom of torture is unqualified, but nearly all other rights have limitations close, clauses. And like I said, Article 5 makes clear that none of the rights can be invoked to undermine any, any other right. And rights clash in that way all the time. And what is different with anti-Semitism and some of the other, if you like, you know, uh, racist phenomenon, is the uh, uh, is the often inability to disentangle these different strands and find a neutral path. Uh, but at the end of the day, uh, you know, um, I mean, we've had, if you like, so much um, mobilization uh, uh, on the subject that um, it's become as if, I mean, it's become taboo, as it were. To stand up against anti-Semitism, it's no longer uh, the anti-Semite who is stigmatized. It is the person who fights against that who is more likely to be stigmatized at this uh, at this time, and that's a, that's a, that's a shame. And I think uh, that needs to be co uh, combated. And this requires, like I said, education, 
awareness raising and enabling people to be self-critical, self-reflective. And for me, this goes beyond anti-Semitism. This goes, this is a challenge of modern life, of the, of the online world, of the multi-globalized world, that everyone, we all carry different biases, but without that uh, awareness and self-reflective uh, attitude and interaction with people who are different, as it were, we'll never get out of these uh, difficulties. Thank, Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, is there anybody else with a question? There's a few in the comments section, but if anybody would like to ask the question personal on a personal level, or Charles, can I can I ask? Yes, go ahead. Um, so really, thank you so much for that talk. And I guess I'm really just asking a follow up on the question on, on what you just said, and that is the question of to what extent is the fight against anti-Semitism emblematic of the fight against all forms of racism? Meaning, does anti-Semitism have a special place? I mean, it's amazing to me that you've devoted so much energy, and there's obviously the need. But I'm wondering, in this whole dynamic of the relationship between minority groups and universalism and human rights, which seems to me a brilliant strategy, does anti-Semitism play a special, does the fight against anti-Semitism play a special role? Um, I will not say a blanket yes to that, uh, but I will not say no to that either. Uh, because there are contexts in which, again, because hate speech is contextual, we have to be mindful of that. There are contexts in which we must never forget uh, the experience Jews have gone through in, our, you know, in recent memory, past, past 70, 80 years, but also throughout history. That, that has to be part of the analysis. Uh, that, that's one. But that's not determinative of itself, because uh, that, beca that can be in some contexts, but other contexts, there can be factors that, that need to be looked into. And likewise, some of the other forms of hatred, um, they can also become very, very, I mean, the idea of intersectionality is something that's I think, important by, by, by in mind here. Um, that in some context, um, you know, certain types of uh, stereotypes, that, as it were, have more toxic effects uh, th th uh, uh, than others. But there is, uh, in a sense, um, that makes, I mean, what I say is every form of hatred has its specificity. And uh, without sort of getting into what, what is called oppression Olympics, I do want to uh, note that there are special challenges that one comes across in combating anti-Semitism. And, um, and one has to be mindful of, the, of these specific challenges uh, uh, in addressing, otherwise one will not succeed, su succeed in doing that. And the person who manages to really address this the government that is, who does it well, would have to bear those specialties in mind. Without that in mind, it will not uh, be able to do that. But it doesn't mean it's comparing with any any uh, other uh, other communities uh, or giving a hierarchy. But on an, on a specific issues, on specific context, yes, there could be there would be hierarchies. And if one did not look at those uh, hierarchies, then then we have we have we have a problem. And I'm inclined to say yes to the extent that um, how a governments view Israel mm. and and how. Um, governments are so, if you like, some governments and some parts of the global community are so focused on that particular, uh, you know, state and the issues ar around that does make anti-Semitism a particularly difficult issue to address for many people and therefore one that requires careful handling. That's one. The other, of course, is that the fact that anti-Semitism is so deep-seated, unlike many other, many other forms of hatred, is so deep-seated that also uh, uh, it, it requires uh, it requires careful, careful attention. So I'm saying in a way yes, and I'm saying no. But I think uh, the uh, the ultimate uh, point is that we have to address these issues on a case by case basis, in a context by context basis. So in the USA, for example, or in Canada, for example, or, or, or UK, these can be three different contexts, and certainly very different from say Argentina, South Africa, or India, for, for example. So I think uh, in that con with that context in mind. We have to be careful. We have the, the person who has a duty bearer has to be careful that this particular phenomenon comes with this particular sets of challenges, and we have to address them completely, fully, thoroughly. Thank you, Greg. Thank you. Anybody else have a comment or question? Okay, I'll read uh, one from the chat. Professor Usher Matthias uh, asks the question, makes a statement as well. He said, more insidious than the challenge uh, facing Israel and the international community, 
for, for questioning its very basic existence. Now there's a daily barrage of attacks on the physical safety of Jews that needs to be dealt with. And he refers to Jews that are not just visible Jews uh, with uh, religious identification, such as skull cap, uh, tzitzes, uh, black hat, etc., but that there's an, an immediate and clear danger for all Jewish people. How can you address this, or how can international bodies address this uh, contemporary phenomenon? This is a very, very uh, important, uh, uh, you know, uh, question. Um, in the period I developed the, the report, there were mass shootings targeting synagogues and other places, mass, mass casualties. Um, in May last year, in May the year before, uh, we saw, and again, you know, this comes when there's outbreak of hostilities in the Middle East, there's a spike of attacks on Jews that threaten their physical physical survival, you know, physical safety and life, limb, limb and liberty. And again, this requires a range of responses. Number one, of course, is uh, at the, at the if you like, call face, have policing. That's important. That's, that's one. But then it also requires that uh, in addition to policing, there are easy ways to report. And there is, when reports are done, they are taken seriously and they are lo looked into by people who understand the problem and who can deal with the problem. That's just at the, if you like, at the, you know, call face. But there are backroom things they have to do as well. And this is where I think uh, messaging, constant messaging, that there be zero tolerance of anti-Semitic attacks, although, along with other forms of attacks, have to, ha, has to be made. Um, there must be certainty that there be no toleration of, of, of that. There must also be positive measures that deal with prejudice, um, that, uh, like I said, educational awareness raising and so on and so forth, interaction. So it, it requires, a, I mean, the UN has an action uh, plan for hate speech globally. Uh, it calls for a whole of society approach. Uh, for anti-Semitism, uh, I would call for a whole of humanity approach because it goes it needs to go beyond just societal parts coming together. All of us as human beings need to stand up uh, uh, against uh, against anti-Semitism, given the history, given uh, its recent uh, uh, expressions, and given, like you said, the potential uh, it, it presents uh, for for the future. Like I said, you know, when I was when I was doing my report, the the disproportionate amount of violent attacks uh, that Jews faced. The proportion of their presence in the world as population or in countries was shocking. Of course, this could be a function of the resources dedicated to reporting, but that wasn't enough. That doesn't explain because there, there is reporting done across the board as well. So the, the margin was so high, it was shocking. So I think um, states have to take this very seriously. I mean, like I said, the pandemic again showed, we've been saying, you know, um, Professor Kotler says this all the time, you know, anti-Semitism is, is a light sleeper. It's the first to be sort of, you know, uh, go out of the coal mine. And a week into the pandemic or so, just a few weeks of the pandemic, we have, you know, people, people are blaming Jews for its spread. And then again, with that come, come, come the attacks. So given the, if you like, wafer thin as it was margin of safety, a Jewish person has in a street in London, Berlin, Brooklyn, or wherever else, there's a need to make sure that there is resilience built in society to fight against anti-Semitism. Okay, thank you. Uh, so Andrea Spindel, who's in, uh, from Toronto, who runs an organization combating anti-Semitism. The floor is yours for a question or comment. Thank you. <clears throat> First of all, I think not only is, uh, is your work outstanding, but you are very courageous in speaking about it, I think. And I, I think a lot of what we're experiencing is the lack of courage on the part of the leadership in just about every field. So even governments that have said they adopted IRA have done nothing about educating it, people about it. Every single aspect of a government corporate, their crown corporations and departments should all be given training on how to identify anti-Semitism. And I don't see that happening. Um, you talk about more education. I'm I'm the cynic here because I believe that it's the educational field that is causing a lot of the damage. And um, and I don't see any university president standing up to it. I don't see any school board standing up to it. We have made representation to three school boards. And what happens, and I mentioned it in the comments, is we're immediately met with, well, if you deal with that, then you better deal with Islamophobia. And all of a sudden, the issue isn't anti-Semitism. There's always this notion of balance, which actually I think denies the right, the fact that Jew hatred is growing and is more serious than other forms of racism or hate. 
I don't know if you have a comment about another model than the human rights model, but the human rights organizations, the social justice movement is heavily funded to stop everything about defending Israel or the Jewish people's rights. So what's another model? Because this one isn't working. Education isn't working. The human rights model isn't working. And we are in no way able to raise the kind of money that our enemies are spending. Right. Um, on the funding issue, I will park a response to that for the moment, but other, other bits, of, bits of this. Now, the human rights model also comes with it, a framework to assess the effort made by states. So clearly, so what I'm saying is human rights provides a way of, first of all, institutionalizing the framework, so making, setting up in, in law and making sure there's redress, there are institutions, there are courts, which can, that, that part of it, that, that's, 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 that's one. The other element, of course, is accountability. Now, it's not enough for a government, say Canada or any other government, to say we are committed to combating anti-Semitism and adopt the other definition. It must show the effort it makes, it is making, to ensure it translates into an experience that is, that is if you like, uh, working for the affected communities. So first of all, you need to ask, like you said, okay, adopt the working work definition. Have you trained uh, your staff on this? If we haven't done, we, we, they, have, they have not done human rights work here. Um, then even if you train them, have you given the resources to respond when something occurs? So whether it is their own work time or other material, that has to be ful fulfilled. And then if you, if you train them, if you got them resources, is it actually working, functioning? In other words, are they publish, publishing any reports of their work? Are people able to access them? Are victims of anti semitic attacks able to access them? And what happens when they access them? How quickly do they address them? Does it take weeks, months, or whatever? Or do they get double victimized for reporting the issue to them? How does it work? So reports, reports that. And finally, uh, indicators on how the students in this case feel about the pressure that they face. Now, states must do this sort of audit regularly uh, and enable audits by uh, different communities so that they can be held to account. So without accountability, there's no human rights. Otherwise, just propaganda. We use, we're seeing human rights being used as, as propaganda rather than as an accountable tool for governments. So I think uh, uh, an, uh, um, an adverse or misuse of the module doesn't necessarily mean we should abandon the module. I think we should rectify the module and, and, and make, make it better. I say it's also because I, I am not uh, aware of another model that could do better uh, because the human rights is supposed to work for everybody when it works well. Now, on, on, on Islamophobia and, and, uh, and the same design, I think it's a bad excuse. Uh, we can never excuse, we can never cite our failure uh, to perform a duty by saying we have other duties. That, that's, not, that's not right. They must find a way to perform all duties. And, and I think uh, Canada is certainly capable of, of doing that. Um, is its commitment has to has to be there to do that. I am also opposed to comparing, you know, uh, comparing if you like uh, communities. That is wrong. Uh, I, I always advise people: don't tell me that just because there's other definition, there must something else for us. No, remove that comparison. You can say you have a definition of your own because you need monitoring, but don't tell me that because Ira has one, you should have one. That's not relevant for me at all. Because what we need to do is not talk against each community but allyship, build bridges. And I think Jewish communities have been very good, in fact, even paying a price for doing this, for standing up for other communities. Uh, very often, uh, Jewish groups are accused of harboring refugees and migrants, and therefore, you know, to go back to an old trope here, undermining the, if you like, purity of the, uh, of the bigger community. And that's because of allyship here. But, but I think allyship is important. In this world full of hate, what really is important is people to realize that when you are safe, I am a little bit more safer. If I am safe, it probably helps you become safer as well. That we understand that understanding that we are all interconnected. We can never achieve something at the expense of somebody, somebody else. So the argument that we can't protect Jews because then we have to protect Muslims and you name it who else is, is a fake argument. It's an excuse. We should uh, uh, shoot through it. In other words, expose its, its, its hollowness and tell them, no, you have resources to do this. It's like saying, because I am teaching uh, kids in this primary school, I have no money to fund the school in this state. That's wrong. State's obligations are to everybody and having obligations to all is no excuse against performing, performing them. When states fail to protect communities, they become open uh, to give those communities self-government of, of, of various forms. In, in other words, its legitimacy is, is in question. So if anyone tells, tells anyone that we can't protect, say, Muslims, we can protect Jews or, or vice versa, that community is playing each 
against each 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 against each other. That's wrong, and that community, that government is failing and, and doing it deliberately so as well. I I can see no reason why a government cannot protect everybody's interests on equal footing. That's what they are supposed to do. It's only when they fail to do that, everybody succumbs to uh, I think you know a bad place. Okay, thank you. So. Professor Shahid, thank you so much for being here today and sharing your experience and your wisdom and uh, all the excellent work that you've been doing. Continued success and strength in your work on anti-Semitism and human rights in general. So thank you for being here. It's, I see uh, people appreciate you on our session and, and beyond. So thank you. Um, and I'd also like thank Sorry. you. And I'd also like to say next week to continue on the human rights vein. We have Professor Erwin Kotler, who will be speaking in the ISGAP Wolf seminar. His lecture is entitled Findings and Recommendations, Reflect, Reflections from Canada's Special Envoy on Preserving Holocaust Remembrance and Combating Antisemitism. So Erwin will be with us next week. So we have a, a very powerful human rights uh, duo in our, in our seminar series. So thank you, everybody, for being here. And again, Ahmed, thank you so much for your sharing your wisdom. Have thank a, you so much. Thank you all. Thank you. I'll be in touch and have, have a safe rest of your week, everybody. Stay well.